So my research is a little bit different than, I guess, the standard corporate finance research. Um, and so I'm interested in, in understanding how do we bring the financial market and formal financial markets to developing countries and to, to resource poor settings. And so one of my, my big focuses in my research agenda is to really understand microfinance. How, is it, how does it work? How well is it doing? And can we take lessons from microfinance to, to developing other kinds of financial products that might make banks um, be able to reach out to the poor communities in developing countries a little bit better than they're currently doing now? Okay, so I'll give a little bit of background on how I'm thinking about this problem and how I'm thinking about the, the, the microfinance problem uh, before I get into my own, uh, my own research. But you know, the, the, standard, the standard challenges in lending to the poor are, are pretty straightforward. So you know, first, the poor have no collateral. There's, there's nothing they can pledge um, uh, at, at the bank to get a loan. Their cash flows, their incomes aren't very observable, and they're also not very steady. So it's, it's really hard to to go ask a person, what is your monthly income, and have any way of verifying that, or have any way of you know, having legal recourse to, to repaying the loan in case of default. And so the third point, the, the institutions in developing countries are, are notoriously poor. So in India, for example, resolving a land dispute might take 10 years. And so there's really no scope for them to adjudicate uh, any sort of disputes between creditors and lenders for, for small amounts of credit. And then finally, there are information problems. And so in the US, we have a credit bureau. There's a lot of information at the disposal of lenders. And that helps, um, and it helps uh, borrowers build reputations for themselves in the market. And this is just not available in, in developing countries. And so you know, even in the US, we've had problems with each one of these. You know, the mortgage market and, and collateral hasn't gone so well. The information still isn't great. But what do you do in countries where you don't have nothing to start with, where, where, uh, where we're starting from square one? Uh, and so the, the world's poor don't really fit into this lending paradigm. And I think microfinance is a really fascinating innovation because it has found a way, despite all of these problems, to really get resources into poor villages. And uh, there's been a lot of research recently that highlights the limitations in microfinance. But I think my point of view is, well, let's figure out what's working about it and how the contractual innovations in microfinance can be maybe spread to other settings or to other types of financial products. So uh, I think it's important to just um, fix ideas and, and make sure all of you kind of are thinking about the same thing as, as I am when I talk about microloans. So the standard borrower is taking maybe a $150 loan. These loans mature after a year, and oftentimes borrowers will take another loan. Uh, the interest rate tends to be around 30% annualized, in India at least. And the repayments are on a weekly basis. So people go and make a weekly small installment every single week at the same time and place and meet face to face with the loan officer. So it's, a, it's kind of a costly intervention so that the loan officer can learn something about the clients. Um, usually the loans are intended for household businesses. Um, this is a hard thing to check, money's fungible, but the idea is that micro entrepreneurs will take the loan, buy an asset, and then they'll have a more profitable business. Okay. And then another common characteristic of microfinance, especially the Grameen Bank style model, is that individuals do all of this together. They do this in groups of you know, anywhere from 5 to 30 individuals. They'll meet at the same time and place with these 30 individuals every week. They'll learn a lot about each other. Uh, and they'll, you know, they'll sort of take attendance together. They'll recite oaths together about how it's good to you know, run your business well, how it's good to repay your loans, how you should live an upstanding moral life. Um, and then sometimes there's a joint liability structure where actually people are responsible for helping each other out. And even when there's no formal joint liability, this group of people, they know a lot about each other, as I said. And so if, if one of the borrowers has a shortfall one week, they often uh, ask the other people in the group to, to make the payment on their behalf. And so this is delegating a lot of the costs to the, to the peer group, to the village, and the lender can potentially benefit. So generally, there are very high repayment rates. Most of the clients are women. And there are many forms microfinance institutions or MFIs can take. So this is a, a picture uh, on the left I found online, but it's very indicative of the Indian microfinance context. You'll have maybe 30 women in a room at a repayment meeting. They generally don't look so happy, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's really standard. They'll, they'll sit in rows of their group members. Uh, the credit officer will be in the front, and then they make their payments, take attendance, say their oath, and then they'll, they'll, they'll be on their way for the day. And at the back of the room, this one happens to be, I guess, in a, in a bank branch. And so this, this chalkboard in the back has some details about how well the branch is doing. On the right-hand side is the piece of paper, the loan card that the client has in her house. And 
Um, she makes 50 repayments of equal sizes week after week, and this person is sort of 18 weeks into her loan cycle. And you know, she'll keep repaying on the, on the reverse side of the card and then hopefully get a new loan once that loan is paid off. Okay. So I think the big question is, you know, why is microfinance able to actually penetrate these villages, provide credit to these rural places where the banks have really been unable to do it? And I think taking a step back and looking at the economic theories of this is really helpful. So I think some of the, the main contenders for, for why this is working is the first one's dynamic incentives. Individuals won't get a new loan if they default on their current loan. And so the future credit stream will be cut off. And since they're already credit constrained, that actually might be costly. Uh, the second one is a psychological explanation um, that maybe this microfinance contract structure, repaying one, uh, one week at a time, small amounts, seeing the loan officer every week, this kind of builds a self-control device. So it might be a more helpful psychological uh, device than maybe a loan where you have to pay the entire thing off at the end. So there may be pluses in, in that dimension. And the one that I've, I've been focused on in my past work has been this peer dimension. How important are the peer effects in determining an individual's ability to repay or desire to repay? Um, and, and maybe you could think about this as commoditizing social capital instead of physical capital. And so my big research question that I'm going to talk about for the, for the remainder of of my presentation is, how important is this? Is this actually a real effect? Is this something that lenders benefit from uh, that might reduce the cost of lending, making microfinance sort of more replicable? Or is this actually just a sideshow? Um, and so I'm going to provide a little bit of evidence uh, about this. And one thing I want to highlight is that you know, in, in rural villages, social capital is incredibly important. There aren't formal safety nets. And so you really have to rely on your neighbors and your peers uh, to help you out, um, I guess, both with childcare, with, with little loans if necessary, with connections potentially to suppliers of your business, and so on and so forth. So these linkages tend to be extremely important on, on many dimensions. Okay. So as I said, the, the main question that, that I asked in, in one of my papers is how important are these peer effects? And uh, do borrowers actually exhibit better repayment behavior when their peers are also making on-time payments? And the consequence of this, if this is true, is that these peer effects would then lower the cost of, of intermediation for the micro lenders. And so that's why it's economically important to, to understand. Okay. So you know, you, we might start out and say, let's, let's just look at some data about this. How, how does it look in the data that you know, if, if my neighbor repays, am I more likely to repay? So we can go to the data and we can look at this and in, in the data set, um, for this project, if you do that, it looks like that, that coefficient is 80%. If my neighbor repays, I'm 80 percentage points more likely to repay. If my neighbor defaults, I'm 80 percentage points more likely to default. So that's one way of thinking about it. But you know, it's not so simple. We have to take a step back. What, what else could be going on there? So if the two of us are both farming households, um, and my neighbor and I have plots that are adjacent to each other, you know, my neighbor might have a bad weather shock, I'm going to have the same bad weather shock. It's going to look like both of us don't repay our loans because we're affecting each other. But actually, it's just that we have very similar livelihoods. Um, and so, so it's really hard to kind of separate that problem out. And then the second one is that you know, maybe my friend or my neighbor influences me, but then I influence my neighbor, my neighbor influences me. And it's kind of a circle, and it's hard to untangle uh, the exact uh, effect from one person to the other. So this is what we call the reflection problem. And these two things make answering this, this simple sounding question of how influential are my peers on my behavior quite difficult. Okay. So as Andreas was saying, you need, uh, you need some sort of natural experiment or some sort of trick to kind of get, get this. And so I use a, a natural experiment that occurred in India back in 2006 to kind of think about these issues a little bit more, um, more in depth. So um, this is, again, a map of India. The, the pink area is the state of Andhra Pradesh. There are 84 million people living there. And I was focusing on this little district called the Krishna district, which you can think of as like a county in the US. So what happened there? Well, in 2006, a local bureaucrat just made it illegal for people to repay their loans. There are lots of reasons that I don't, I don't, need, I don't really have time to get into, but you know, this was sort of a political play. And so he caused 100% of people to be in default. There's nothing differentiating anybody's de default or repayment behavior. It became illegal. So as the, as the months and, and years went by, uh, little by little, it, did, it was no longer illegal, and people started repaying. 
And so I'm using this as a chance to say, well, what are the characteristics of people who, who start to repay, and can we look for pure effects in this particular context? <coughs> Um, so first, some, some anecdotal evidence. Uh, this is basically just a histogram. It's called something fancy, but it's a smooth version of a histogram. And on the x-axis is you know, the fraction of people in that room who paid after three and a half years. Uh, and so you, know, you can see there are just two big clusterings of, of points. There's one at zero, nobody in that room is repaying, and another one at one, everybody in that room is repaying. Now again, this could be because of the people in, the, in that room all are very similar, but it could also be because of this more causal channel. So I, I went to the Krishna district in, in 2009, and I talked to a lot of loan officers, and they, they all kind of were thinking, you know, when we're trying to get people to repay, it's just a lot easier if that person has a, less of the loan outstanding. And so uh, when I got the data, it turned out that that was absolutely true. So the x-axis of this, um, this plot is the number of weeks the borrower had been borrowing from the MFI. And it turns out that after 50 weeks, your loan is over and you get a new loan. After 100 weeks, your second loan is over and you get a third loan. So what that means is somebody in week 49 only has one week of the loan left to pay. It's a very small debt burden. As soon as they repay, they're going to have access to new credit. And so they have very high repayment incentives. Now, if just on the other side of the line, somebody who took the loan two weeks later um, sorry, two weeks earlier, is now somebody who has, is in their second loan, they have a huge amount of debt left, and it's really costly for them to repay. So I use this to say, well, suppose Mauricio and I are neighbors, Mauricio and I are in the same loan group, what would happen to my repayment if Mauricio happened to have really good incentives versus if just by chance Mauricio had really bad incentives? And so um, doing this analysis, I, I'm able to conclude that actually pure effects do seem to matter, not 80% like those correlations would suggest. But in general, if my whole group, if that whole room is repaying, I'm 10 percentage points more likely to repay my loan. And that's equivalent to the lender actually writing off 10 weeks of my liability. And so, so these effects are, are relatively large. Um, I also find that if, if I look at the data and I estimate uh, a model of repayment, I can say that the revenues to the lender are actually higher because there are these pure effects at work. And so all of these things fostering pure effects in microfinance might actually be you know, making this a, a, a less costly form of intermediation. And then finally, I think another surprising result was that you know, it really matters who in your room is repaying, but if you look outside of that room, the effects pretty much go away. So there's a very localized pure effect, and this is consistent with strong networks and the connections in that network really matter. But maybe, you know, all these other people, it's, it's, it's hard to keep track of everybody outside of that room. So maybe that level isn't, isn't as essential. Okay, so unfortunately, uh, and I'll, I'll wrap up in, in just a minute, but unfortunately, history uh, tends to repeat itself. And this whole crisis has happened again on a much larger scale, uh, starting in 2010. Um, and this, this stock chart is from Google Finance, and it's just the SKS stock price. So SKS is a very large microlender, and they went public, actually, in September of 2010. Uh, and it was you know, highly touted. It was very controversial. Uh, had SKS sold out, their social mission, et cetera, et cetera. There are lots of people who became very wealthy. But just a month later, in October, the government of the entire state decided to make a very similar policy and say, guess what, guys, it's illegal to, to, to run a microfinance enterprise. And so still today, it's illegal in that state to make collections, and SKS's stock went on sort of a, a long free fall, where they lost almost 90% of the value. Um, and so, you know, this is terrible for microfinance, but as researchers, we want to seize, our, seize all the opportunities we can. And so what else can we learn about microfinance? So we understand these social mechanisms are really important, but how about maybe that psychological mechanism? Um, who's really able to benefit when they get a loan written off and who's really going to have a hard time? Which businesses look like they're going to make it through a liquidity crisis and which ones don't? So I currently have um, a research staff in, in Hyderabad that are surveying 6,000 households in, in uh, neighborhoods. And we're going to try to tease out even more of these issues. Who is microfinance helping? Are they going to expensive money lenders instead of this cheaper source of credit when the, the industry collapses? Uh, so these are some of the issues I'm working on, and I, I hope that by getting a better understanding of this particular product, we can kind of brainstorm and think of better ways for maybe banks to offer products that have some of these features. You know, maybe tying some sort of 
peer component to the standard bank account would, would make things better. Or maybe thinking about individual psychology when designing a financial product would also be better and allow the banks to really reach places they haven't been able to reach. So thanks a lot.